Hey Camp Evergreen, my name is Mike and I have had the privilege to hang out with you before, also known as last summer. Uh, check this out. A year ago, just over a year ago, I almost died. Now when I say I almost died, I literally mean I almost died. What happened was for a few days, my stomach felt really, really off. Now that particular week, I went to a Mexican restaurant and ate some Mexican food. So I started blaming the beans and the hot sauce, thinking that's why my stomach felt really weird. But that's not what was happening at all. But what I did know was over the week, it got worse and worse and worse until 3 a.m. on a Friday morning, I woke up and I was just in so much pain and I just started vomiting non-stop. But again, I still blame the Mexican food. My wife, she starts panicking and she says, Mike, something is wrong. We need to call 911. And I told her like, honey, don't worry about calling 911. You know, um, I'll go back to bed. And if I feel poorly in the morning, maybe I will Google it. You know, the, a typical guy response, let's not get help, let's turn to Google and you know, they can be the doctor. My wife, who is very smart, says, um, no, that's not what we're doing. We are going to call 911. The paramedics come, they rush me to the hospital, and the whole time, I don't have something in my eye right now, but that's okay. So the whole time I'm, I'm crying, I'm tearing up, it's so emotional. <laughs> no, 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 no. So here I go to the hospital, rush to the hospital, I'm throwing up nonstop. And my stomach was like pretty swelled up. Something was weird, it didn't seem like food poisoning. I get there and the whole time the paramedic was saying, you know what, we think it's food poisoning. We think you'll be fine. We'll put an IV in you, I'm sure. They'll look at you in the ER and you will be out probably before lunchtime. Which I'm thinking, this is great because I had to speak at a conference the following day. So we're in the hospital, I'm in the ER. They do one test, and then another one, and then one more. And around 11 a.m. in the morning, I'm thinking the doctor's going to come and say, Mike, you're fine, you're just a big wimp go back home, avoid Mexican food, and you'll be fine. Unfortunately, that's not what happened at all. The surgeon comes in and he says, Mike, here's what has happened. Over the last week, your intestines, they were twisting, twisting, and twisting, causing them to slowly expand. And what happened was, um, it looked like your intestines tore open. And we need to bring you in to have surgery in one hour and we need to cut you open 13 inches from like here to like below what you, you know, below that. And uh, uh, we need to cut you open 13 inches. Now I'm thinking I have a conference to speak at the next day. I don't know if you cut someone in half if they will be able to do a conference. So I start asking the doctor, the surgeon, I'm like, hey, is there any other way like, it's 2020, can't you just like poke a hole in me and not cut me all the way open? Or can't you just like go up, you know, maybe a different part of my body and stitch it all up that way? And the surgeon was like, well, we could do that, but it wouldn't help you. I'm like, okay, never mind. let's, let's not do that plan. I went in for surgery and when I came out four or five hours later, you know, I'm cut in half, you know, stitched up everywhere. I got tubes coming out of everything and it was absolutely horrible. Now, for the next couple of weeks, I was in the hospital. One complication after another that turned into pneumonia. Then I had like a serious infection in one of my arteries. And then eventually I developed a post surgery blood clot in the lung. Like that's significant, I'm coughing up blood, painful. And the blood clot I had was very severe and one out of three people die from this blood clot. And the one out of three, those stats apply for all ages, not just a certain demographic. So one out of three people die through what I am dealing with. Now I share this story because while I was in the hospital, and when I was recovering, four and a half month journey to recover, I had many, many Christians, very well-meaning Christians, 
message me. They sent me text messages, Facebook messages, Instagram messages, and all of them, they meant very well. But many of them, they would try, for some reason, try to explain why this was happening. Why God was allowing me to go through this medical issue. And the interesting part is, everybody, they seem to have different answers or different responses on why God is allowing this. Why this negative thing is happening. You know, one person messaged me who I don't remember ever meeting in my life. And they said, well, maybe God wants you to stop doing ministry. I'm like, uh, well, you think he would tell me that first, <laughs> you know, rather than you? I had one person say, oh, don't worry, just trust God. Don't worry about paying your mortgage or any of those house payments. I'm like, again, that sounds nice, but my bank worries about that. Um, and to say, don't pay my mortgage, trust God. Well, the way I pay my mortgage is through doing ministry. And at that point, I had an 81 city speaking to her completely canceled because of the health issues. But people are telling me, don't worry, Christian advice. Uh, one person tried to tell me, you know what, Mike? One out of three people, don't worry about that. Those stats don't apply to you because you're a Christian. And then they said, you know, listen, the sun always comes up. And I'm like, yeah, but not for one out of those three people. And I'm pretty sure one of them were a Christian. And I had all this advice from just have enough faith, just keep praying and well-meaning advice. But I also realized in that moment, in the midst of my pain and uncertainty, and in the midst of this trouble, some of that advice was really discouraging. When we're trying to explain why God is allowing it, deep down, I think the reality is none of us know why. And maybe you can resonate that with that right now with COVID-19. I, I see all over social media, people trying to explain what's happening or why God's allowing it or what God's doing. And the interesting part is it seems like everybody has a completely different answer and a completely different reason. And I think one of the challenges and one of the reasons is because the Bible doesn't really talk about it. You know, yes, in a broad sense, it does. And Jesus says in, in uh, John 16, he says, in this world, you will have trouble. Like he says that. But the Bible doesn't say, hey, in your particular life, this is why you're going to go through this and why that person might go through something else. Like the Bible doesn't talk about that. And I'll be honest, I can't explain God in those moments. I might could explain God in a situation where I can explain why there's trouble in the world. And we can go back to Adam and Eve and us humans turning away from God and then sin entered the world, and, uh, and the corruption, the curse, and, and now you see sickness, and disease, and poverty. I, I can probably do a good job explaining why the world's not perfect. I can't do a good job explaining why this person goes through something, and this person doesn't. Um, I can't explain why someone is born with perfect health, why someone over here might be born with some sort of physical complication. I can't explain God in those particular situations. I can't explain God why someone like me is born in a beautiful city like Toronto, where we have access to clean water and, and plumbing and uh, internet and education and all those luxuries, while some people are born in Alberta. You know, it's just not fair. It's really hard to explain God in those moments. No, in all seriousness, though, like I can't explain why someone born in this beautiful country where you have all those luxuries, where someone else might be born in a country where clean water is not a luxury at all. Like, it's, you know, so it is a luxury. Sorry, the clean water, like, you don't have that simple, easy access to it. So I can't really explain God in those moments. And I think sometimes we have to understand it's okay. It's okay that we don't explain God. It's okay that we don't understand because you can still trust God. There's a popular story in the Bible, maybe you've heard it a thousand times, um, in Mark chapter 4. What's happening? We got these followers, these disciples, these students who are following Jesus, this rabbi, this teacher, the Christ. And Jesus is in the boat. He's asleep. These men are in the boat and they're not asleep. And what happens is a big storm comes up, a physical storm, winds, waves, flashing, you know, water in the eye, like all that sort of stuff. 
And what happens is uh, these disciples, they start freaking out. Like trouble hits them unexpectedly. They start freaking out. And what do they do? They wake Jesus up and they say, don't you care we're going to perish? Like, don't you care we're going to drown? Which, to be honest, when we're going through trouble, and if it's COVID-19, if it's family issues, if it's finance issues, job loss, if it's maybe you were dumped by your boyfriend or girlfriend, when you go through trouble unexpectedly, it's funny how that's where our brain goes sometimes. Like, God, don't you care? Like, don't you care what I'm going through? Of course God cares, but sometimes in those moments, our theology gets thrown out the window, doesn't it? And what we know of God and who God is, because the Bible says so, we throw that out the window. And then it's very easy to ask the whole why question. Now, why is this happening? And I think that's why when Christians start giving this well-meaning advice, which might not be the best advice sometimes, I think that's why we cling on to it and put our hope in that advice. Um, and that could be dangerous sometimes. So this story, though, what happens is Jesus, he wakes up, he calms the storm, and he says, you have little faith. In other words, to translate it into 2020, he says, why don't you trust me yet? Why don't you trust me? Now that story that Jesus shared that we see in the Gospels, the whole point of that story is looking at these disciples who have lost control or they're in this time of uncertainty because of a, of a physical storm. And Jesus, he's saying, why don't you trust me? That's the point of the story. Now, the problem is sometimes people like myself or different uh, pastors or Christians, we take that story and we say, hey, listen, look at God. He calmed that physical storm in the lives of the real men way back then. Therefore, whatever storm you're going through, God's going to calm that storm and fix it or heal it or restore it. And we have to understand, just because there's that story in the Bible, we can't necessarily always take that and apply it to our part in life. We can take the, do we trust God in those moment part of life and apply it. But to say a, a big leap from someone saying, hey, listen, God caused, you know, calm that physical storm way back then. Therefore, he's going to heal you of cancer. That's a pretty big leap. Now, I'm not saying God can't heal someone from cancer. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I have a friend who was healed from cancer because people prayed for her and they believe that God healed her. But to say, hey, here's a scripture in Mark 4, God calms, cause, uh, calm the storm, therefore he's going to fix your family issue. Well, what happens if he doesn't? And I think that's the big problem and the danger sometimes when we start saying, hey, here's what God is doing or here's what he's going to do. We put our hope and trust into the circumstance turning out a certain way, or we put our hope and trust into what that person said, and what if it doesn't work out the way we expect? For many of us, we get discouraged. Now, here's another question about that story. Usually when we hear this, we, we relate to the whole, don't you care? I relate to that. That's my prayer all the time. When something goes off in my life, something wrong in my life, I'm going through trouble, like, God, don't you care? We can all relate to that, why don't you trust me yet? You have little faith. God calming the storm. Maybe there's situations in your life where he did do a miracle and calm the storm, but maybe in other circumstances he didn't. Now the one part in that story, just to wrap it up and to think about this a little bit, what we typically don't answer or ask with that story is who caused the storm? That's interesting. So by default, someone will say, well, God, God, of course God caused the storm. Then they say, okay, so he caused the storm to calm the storm. And someone might say, yeah, to teach them a lesson. Well, that makes sense in that story, but let's talk about COVID-19. If we're saying God caused COVID-19, that's fine, I guess, if you're talking to someone who got healed, who had it and got healed from uh, and recovered from COVID-19. But what about the person who passed away? Are you going to tell that family, hey, God caused that and caused this result? Because that is very dangerous and could be very discouraging and could actually lead people away from God or be a reason why someone wants nothing to do with them at all. Well, did God cause a storm? Could it be, you know, we live in a world where there is an enemy and the enemy doing his thing to, you know, cause trouble? And as he does that, he's trying to like deceive us and make us want to think, hey, is God doing all this? And maybe it's not at all. That's a question to ask. 
Or maybe we just live on a planet where because of the results of sin, like there is disease, there is corruption, there is poverty, there is brokenness, there is pain. And this is just what we see as the domino effect of us turning our back from God. But we don't usually ask that question. And if I'm being bluntly honest, I don't know the answer. Maybe it's one of those three. Maybe it's all those three. Maybe there's something else. But I know from my experience, from going through some tough times and also being a pastor, I know I have to be very, very careful how I respond in this moment. And I'm learning it's okay to say, I don't know. I don't know why the world is the way it is right now. I don't know why there's a virus going around. I don't know why people are losing jobs and just struggling with loneliness and depression and all those things. I don't know why. What I do know in the midst of that though, is God is with us, that he does care for us. He loves us, period. But I think our response to someone who's asking that big question, why, I think I don't, I don't know might be the best response right now. And maybe for you, you're listening to this and it has nothing to do with COVID-19. Maybe for you, it's family issues. It's lonely. Maybe it's depression, mental health. Maybe you lost a loved one. Maybe you lost a job. Whatever it is, and you're asking why, why, why? And maybe you're taking your eyes off who the Bible says God is and you're so focused on the why uh, question that you want answered. For you, I want you to know, I don't know why. But what I do know is God still loves you and that you can still trust him and you can still walk with him through this in the uncertainty. I know his grace is sufficient. His grace is enough. And although you might not feel that, because you feel a certain way, that does not mean that's the truth. The truth is God loves you, period. And anytime we forget that, just open the Bible and read about what Jesus did on the cross. And that is love. But I want to give you peace in this moment because there is a lot of uncertainty and confusion. And maybe you are the one who received some poor advice along the way from a well-meaning person, but maybe it did more damage than anything. I want you to take that little advice and just throw it out the window. You know, if it discouraged you, if it made you want to turn your back from God, throw it out the window, be content with the answer. I don't know why this is happening, but what we do know when Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. He said, take heart because I have overcome the world. He is with you. There's still power in the cross. And I don't know what the big plan is. And I don't know what it's all going to look like, but I do believe we can still follow God every step of the way in the midst of all this uncertainty. So be with him. Don't let this be a reason to turn away from God because you don't understand why the trouble has entered your life. And I encourage you every step of the way, every step of the way, abide in him, remain in him, follow. I'm going to pray and then uh, all the best. Lord God, thank you for whoever is listening to this for uh, Evergreen. Maybe it's a, like a student, maybe it's a camper, maybe it's a staff member, maybe it's a family. And my hope is we can just be content with the answer of, I don't know. I don't know why this is happening. I don't know why we're going through what we're going through. And maybe it's a personal situation. Maybe it's a pandemic, whatever it is, whatever causes us to ask that big question. My hope is we can understand like, it's okay not to know. And for anyone who's been discouraged by maybe someone trying to explain the why, oh, that's dangerous sometimes, and that can be very discouraging. So my, fa my father, my hope is if someone's walking around with that weight, that they can just let it go, let it off their shoulders, and understand that you do care for us, you do love us, we do live in a broken world, but that doesn't mean you're not here. So help us, lead us, and help us just, you know, keep founded our foundation, you know, in your word and understanding who you are. And teach us how to trust you in these moments because that's a life lesson. And that's something we can draw from that story with the, uh, with the storm in Mark 4. You have little faith. Why don't you trust me yet? So let's focus more on maybe that part of the conversation rather than the whole why is this happening and if we can learn how to trust you in the uncertain times, especially when we can't see maybe what the next step looks like, that kind of faith is going to take us so far in life. 
It's almost like you're reaching out your hand and saying, trust me, hold my hand, I'm with you. And it might not look exactly how you think it will, but I'm with you every step of the way. So give us shalom, give us peace. And the peace is not peace where life is trouble-free. It's the peace that in the midst of trouble, you are with us every step of the way. Let us know that in the midst of uncertainties in this time, in our lives, and in these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.